Hi, we're here with Carlos Santana and Michael Shreve, uh, two artists that need no introduction in celebration of the 50th anniversary of Caravanserai. Now I have to tell our listeners and and viewers, uh, this fourth studio album for Santana uh, was a game changer for me as a music listener and a fan. Um, I still see the album cover. And it's, it's part of pop culture. You know right away, you get a feeling when you look at the album cover. And the first question I wanted to ask is when you delivered this album to Columbia, I recall Clive Davis saying, this is career suicide. And what were you thinking at the time when you changed directions from being pop Latin rock to this fourth album that went in another direction. What, what was going through your mind at that time when Clive said something like that? Michael? Well, we were so proud of this record. We, we, I mean, we just, we worked hard on it and we were really proud of it and felt that it re- was representative. And Clive said that, and um, you know, there was really nothing to be done. I believe, Carlos said something like, you've said your piece and something like, that's it, you know? So <laughs> we hear you, but nothing's going to really stop us. So um, I don't know. It, I think it didn't matter. We knew, we knew we were moving in a different direction very well. And I, I think what we felt was we were so proud of it, you know, so be it, whatever happens. This is the right thing to do at that time. Yeah, well, honoring, you, it, it, you know, honoring Clive Davis, you know, because who he is and what he what he does is he brings a lot to the table. Just like Bill Graham and Clive Davis, they've been supremely important in our in our lives, you know. Uh, and he was right. There was there wasn't a single within a million miles, you know, in Caravans Arrive. Michael and I were just talking about this. They're not even songs; they're just big slices of life, you know. A song is Oye Como Va or Evil Ways, you know. But we knew that we didn't have like a radio hit or whatever, you know, and we weren't going to stop the album just to create a, a song to, to fit in there because it was like a, a statement. And, uh, and I wanted to, you know, I wanted to even back then honor Bill Graham and Clive Davis, and honor, honor myself, honor Michael, honor everybody, because everybody needs to be validated for what, who they are and what they bring on this planet. Having said that, we were, Michael and I, we were actually pregnant, you know, with this, with this uh, Caravan Sarai thing. Uh, for me, it started uh, naturally and, norm- and organically, as they say, because of the things that I was reading, Paramahansa Yogananda, and which is, that's where I got the name, you know, mm-hmm. Eternal Caravan or Reincarnation. I was like, oh, that's a hell of a statement, you know. Uh, and then we uh, got together with, I think it was Joan Chase, Joan something, who put together, the, you know, some different slides on the, on, the, on the wall. And I said, that one, I want some of that, that red sun or moon, whatever it is, with, with, with a caravan, a of camels and stuff like that. You know, and we, uh, we visualize the music and we visualize the whole concept of it. So we couldn't, you know, we couldn't go back because uh, we're not cowards, you know, we're not, we're not going to be, you know, we're fearless. We're not cowards, man. We're going to go after something that needs to be birthed, you know? Well, yeah. and my understanding, and, and Michael, you, you, I read your piece, you read, the, you wrote this beautiful expressive piece about listening to it after 25, 30 years. Um, I, I did the same thing. It hasn't been, 25, maybe it's been 15 years since I've listened to it from beginning to end. And it did bring me back. And it brought me back to this incredible moment in music history. There was a lot going on then that I could see where you were influenced and you had influence on so many other bands to come. What was happening? What what was the zeitgeist back then where on one hand you were sort of doing Latin rock, but you were also doing progressive rock and you were doing this jazz fusion thing. 
And it was all happening together at a time where it probably was also a very tumultuous time for you with the band and a lot of things going on. Can you comment on that? Sure. It was a, Carlos and I were making a shift spiritually and making different choices um, after, after been through this whirlwind of, you know, success and, you know, and, and so there's a lot of influences around you at the time that we felt it was time to get out of that. Um, and simultaneously, while we were feeling like in more of a spiritual mode and seeking that sort of thing, we were reading the same kind of books and we were, you know, we went guru shopping together and, um, and that was a beautiful thing. You know, it was really wonderful. But simultaneously, what was happening was all this music that was coming out from, from, it was such an exciting period with anything Miles was putting out, Bitches Brew blew the doors open. And then the beautiful thing about Miles is that the musicians that come from him they go on and and become fruitful, you know, and they multiply. And just just those people alone started their own things, and every one of them was a thing of beauty. And it was a different world than we were participating in. But mind you, we used to do this kind of stuff, Carlos and I. We'd hire, not hired, we'd invite Weather Report to open for us for a tour. Mm-hmm. So we could watch them every night, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting that those bands were all on Columbia. It was Weather Report and Herbie and um, uh, Miles, of course. Mm-hmm. And, and you had this thing happening then, musically and, as you say, spiritually. And it was really, I think, a lot of fans' first introduction. It was their... Uh, their first glimpse at the spirituality of what was happening with you, Carlos, and the, the band, and Santana. Everything that was happening around us led Michael and I thrust us into becoming more determined. Uh, you know, on, on the logistics side, when, once I started reading that, uh, that uh, Abraxas was outselling Abbey Road and some of the Rolling Stones and the, and the Who and this and that, you know, I was like, wow, you know, that's quite a compliment, you know, and the numbers ain't lying, you know. <laughs> now, Michael is correct. What was happening at the time with the band and the, uh, and the bands around us, people, we start, people started becoming like cartoons and caricatures of themselves, you know, because when you overindulge, staying all night, doing whatever you're doing, and then the next day you got to play and now you take cocaine to get the energy back and now you're tired and wired and you smell funny and you look horrible. We were like, this shit is depressing, man. We got to do something different, you know? <laughs> so we felt that we needed, here it is, spiritual discipline. That's what Caravan Sarai is about. Caravan Sarai is a statement of pure spiritual discipline Pursuing something that your light, your spirit, your soul, and your heart wants to do that is different than, than your ego and, and, and below the belt, you know, kind of energy. I mean, you know, we're, it's still very sensual, but it's not, that's not the, you know, Abraxas is more, infinitely more sensual. Just look at the album cover, you know. Sure. Uh, and it's okay, you know. We just wanted to make it more sacred, you know, make, make that sensuality energy a lot more you know, like, well, what's it like to make love to an angel, a real angel, you know, kind of thing, you know? And so I said, well, it must be like listening to John Coltrane's music, you know, like, like uh, any of those songs, Crescent, you know, Angel Eyes and Naima, you know, all of those songs, it's a different kind of making love, you know? Uh, and I wanted to play like that. I wanted to be a, a, a lover, and through my guitar over a different frequency than just the obvious stuff. But the main thing for me was that I was very disenchanted and discouraged watching people that I grew up with becoming very predictable and pathetically victims. I don't want to be a victim man. in any, any of my incarnations. I don't want to be a victim. You know, I need to be 
victorious and with triumph and glory. Not with ego, but I want my spirit to have a say so when we bring something to the table. And Michael helped me uh, crystallize all of these elements, you know, because he was constantly feeding me some uh, music that enhanced uh, my appetite, my thirst, you know, with the Pharaoh Sanders, you know, and, and, and Elvin Jones, a lot of Elvin Jones, you know. Mm -hmm. My wife loves Tony. I love Elvin, you sure. know. And, and so the, I think it was Joe Savinol who baptized me and called me, you're the melody man. You know, I said, what? He says, nobody plays melodies the way you do, man. You can, you can play the hell out of a melody. So you're the melody man. And I was like, okay, so I'll just, I'll just concentrate on bringing a nice, heartfelt, soulful melody to whatever Michael brings. You know, and I would come into a room and Michael and, and Doug and Raj were creating this uh, pictures, this moving pictures. And I had to find my way to become Aretha, Etta James, Tina Turner, Nina Simone, with that kind of miles of phrasing, fra phrasing, you know, and some Otis Rush feeling. So that's how I think, you know, I, I think of all these components, but you still have to land and a most memorable melody, like do dee do da, dee do da, do. I'm playing that on waves within. That's, mm -hmm. that's one of the main things that I start with, which is like yeah. a nature boy. You yeah. know, I still want to do nature boy and old Danny boy together. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's a there's a place for that. You know, but that's in the future. Hopefully, in the next, where Michael and I were talking about embarking on a new. Uh, adventure pretty soon and uh, hopefully we can you know bring some of that nature boy and uh, oh Danny boy to put them together you know man I just That's wonderful heard, so I just heard the story of how nature boy happened the other day I read it and it's a, it's an another conversation but all this time I've been a huge fan of that song but it's a fascinating story. Now, uh, I'll tell you about tell it. Us. Okay. So Nat King Cole was approached by a, a person that looked like um, a homeless guy. And in fact, he was, he lived in the park and, but for some reason he was attracted to Nat King Cole and likewise, Nat King Cole treated him like, like, um, like a man, you know, no disrespect and everything else. They visited a couple of times, and then this guy brought these lyrics to him, and and he disappeared. And um, and and Nat King Cole saw it and said, "This is a gift, and I've got to make a song out of this." But um, but yeah, it's beautiful, beautiful wow. piece of music. Carlos, those those notes that you play on that are in my head since I started listening again to this record like a week ago. Like at that place that happens in Waves Within. It's mm -hmm. so perfect. It's just so perfect. It's interesting you brought it up. <laughs> well, legend has it, Michael, that you, in, you introduced Carlos to jazz. Tell me whether that's truth or fiction. Well, it's true. Um, but at that time, we were all living in the, in the same house in uh, San Francisco, and everybody was bringing in their their stuff. I mean, I, I I learned so much just from being around those guys to, to an environment that um, um, it's like I it's like I said at, at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame speech. I said I quickly learned that this was no hippie love thing. This was like a street gang and the weapon is music. It was like, these guys were like, everybody was bringing in their stuff. Corbello had, you know, a, a lot of the Latin stuff. Carlos had a lot of blues and Latin. Greg was like English rock. And and I what I have to offer Carlos, knowing that he was a melody man, was I wanted to get, introduce him to the music, but I thought, how do I do that? And so, you know, Two things: one, Coltrane ballads, and two, Miles kind of blue. 
where the melodies are strong and he could relate and and it worked but it, but Carlos is always saying that about me but I have to give Carlos credit for being open to it you know because mm-hmm. everybody else wasn't you know what I mean right, right. but but, it, it, but that's the way it is when you when 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 destiny comes to play you know mm-hmm. you, you recognize each other's spirit and and that that's what happened with Carlos and I yeah, and you, you hear it right in the first track in the intro. I mean, it, it's, it starts out with the crickets, which it, to me, it's, it's like it predated uh, Pink Floyd's money, where when you hear the cash register, you know it's Pink Floyd. When you hear the crickets, you know what it is. And then you move, you know you're going to go for a ride. And then you have this kind of blue thing happening right in the beginning. And then you're on that journey. And it takes you for the whole album. Uh, in the beginning, you had to listen to side one and then flip it around. Now you can listen through the whole thing without having to t- go to side B. But it, it, it's a journey. You created a, a, an, a, you know, it's an exploration. And that's what sat with me for so many years. And that when I went back and listened to it like you did, Michael, it, it brought back all those feelings that I had the first time I listened to it, which set me on the journey into the world of jazz. Wow. Wow. That's something. There's this word that uh, I've been associated since I was in the in the in, in the crib since a baby. It is called uh, crystal crystallize. You know, mm-hmm. Michael and I we crystallize everything we heard into certain statements. Uh, when we listen to future future primitive, or you listen to this, you listen to that, you hear so many elements. You know, you hear uh, astral traveling from where um, mm-hmm. Pharaoh Sanders. Uh, it's no, there's no, I wasn't surprised when Ralph J. Gleason called on the corner in Caravanserai the most important music that was coming out, you know. And I was like, Damn, Michael, you gotta hear, you gotta read this thing. You know, there's an article on Rolling Stone about it, you know. I remember, and it's very, very uh, uh, validating because. In the beginning, I didn't have such a good relationship with Rolling Stone because I was pissed off because uh, whoever did the write-up for Santana were like, they, they, they said, well, this is a psychedelic mariachi rock band. And I'm like, well, fuck you, you know? <laughs> you know? No, you're not going to do that to me, man, you know? Uh-uh. You know, this is music, world music. And, then, and, it, and, it, and it was, and it is, and it will always be world music, you know? It's very racist to say, well, you're mariachi. Well, you want me to play a fucking piñata music for you from now on? You know, that's not going to happen, man. You know, it's like, and so I had that kind of, you know, like a cat in a dog pound. I like, you know, I didn't have that relationship with Rolling Stone until maybe later, you know, mm-hmm. because I was, I, would, I didn't take it kindly for, for whoever wrote it to try to uh, put a ceiling on, on me in a band. Psychedelic mariachi. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but I'm more than that. You know, I'm definitely more sure. than that. I go to Africa, and I'm not a tourist. I'm part of the family. I can name I can name you a lot of names, and they go to Africa. Nobody knows who they are or even care. But when I go to Africa, people are like, "Oh my God!" You know, it's like Santana. Look, and then they they show me my daughter. You know, Sophia. I go, I don't know what you're talking about. He says, "My wife got pregnant." To Samuel Paty, and and you know, and so I hear that in Paris. I hear you know, the the music from Santana. You can hear it in the Himalayas in a cave. You can hear it in Timbuktu. You can hear it, and you know, so that's when I knew that Santana was one of the first world bands. World, what do you call it? World, world like, music. Huh? World music, world yeah. Music. Like like Bob Marley, you know. Yeah. yeah. I'm very yeah. grateful because of it. And you introduced me to, because I, at the time, I didn't know who Antonio Carlos Jobim was. And I listened to Stoneflower, and I was like, what a beautiful, I, th- I thought it was a, a Carlos Santana song. Of course, years later, I figured out this is this the genius composer from Brazil. Uh, and the Stoneflower on there, it's, it, it's sort of, in, in some ways, I, 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 people have analyzed and overanalyzed your masterpiece. But for me, that was my introduction to Brazilian jazz. And I think that as part of the world music that you're describing, 
That's certainly world music. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, what's special about that also in listening to the record again for me was it's the first time that a upright bass is introduced. Um, that's just that sound alone is so smooth coming in after after Dougie playing all his funky stuff and, and genius stuff. But that sound is so important. And it, it was it was like going in a candy store listening to the record again because I get it. The, like there's so much so much of the journey is sonic, you know. <laughs> Just like the in between the songs, in between the slices, as Carlos calls them, and uh, uh, that's I think that's what p- creates part of the journey is like you know being aware of the sonic stuff. I can't wait to see if we can do some more. Just wait, I've got some ideas for sound and the next one. It's going to be exciting. I, I I'm all jazzed up again. I got to. I got a text from Carlos a, a week or so ago saying, all day I'm listening to Caravan Sarai, you know? And I thought, I know I got to get to that. I got to sit down and get to it. But you know, sometimes I don't go back very often. And sometimes you think, oh, it's going to bring up this memory or that. But it, everything was beautiful and joyous. And it was exciting to revisit it. Here's a quote from Wayne Shorter. He says, I don't call it jazz. He says, I never call me the music jazz. I call it, I dare you. <laughs> That's what he calls it. You know? Sounds like Wayne. And so, you, you know, know. What, what's interesting about um, the intro track, just to go back to that for a second. I recall back then when some people were calling it jazz and then some people saying, That's not jazz. Yeah. Fast forward 50 years. I think anyone that knows anything about jazz knows that the opening track is undeniably jazz. In fact, there has been so much jazz that has come out since you recorded that, that sounds like that, that I I think it's no longer an argument. What what do you think about that? Well, you know, if you want to get down to the real nitty gritty, you can call it making love or the F word. I don't care. The real, the real, what it really is called is called, Energy, divine energy, wanting to, with fire passion, give birth to newness, newness, you know? It, it, when you take people to the old house and they're really old and you put them in a certain place, there's places to take them where they still make them thrive. They put them in buses and they take them to Montana Pius or they take them to go see a play, you know? You don't just sit there and you rot and, all, and, and, and reminisce in memories. You know, yeah. you, you have to thrive, man. You have to thrive, you know, no matter what. And for me, I always been a person that I don't relate at all to victim mentality. I relate to thriving. And so like kids, they get up and you okay, so you're going to bust your toe touching this or bump your head over there. So what? You know, you're still going to get up and, and, and pursue, pursue thriving. That's what I learned from Miles and Coltrane. In Michael Street, thrive, man. Don't be, uh, don't be predictable and, and be stagnant. That's that's re- that's worse than suicide, you know. Uh, so I, I thank you. You know, jazz is for me. Uh, uh, jazz is in downbeat. It's important that these magazines are still here, and it's important that we take these magazines to preschool, junior high school, high school. You know, because when you read these articles, it helps you, like the Bhagavad Gita or the Bible, sometimes even more important than that, because it's not about a, it's necessarily a spiritual path. It's about mm-hmm. all the paths and none of them. For example, people ask me once in a while, well, man, Santana, you're, interesting. you're, you're an interesting dude, man. What's your sign? I go, what do you mean? You know, your sign, astrology. I go, oh, all of them and none of them. And they go... Whoa, no, see, that's not Velcro. And so, therefore, Michael and I can embark on this, this direction, that duration, you know, and no matter where we arrive, we're going to be content and happy, you know? That's right? Yeah. Well, well the, the uh, you know, this album, this classic album, 
Um, I can't remember whether you said it, Carlos or Michael. I read it somewhere. It was the album that wasn't supposed to be. Uh, <laughs> and yet we're so glad it was. Thank you. And uh, we thank you. And uh, Carlos, Michael, it's been a pleasure. And uh, I would look forward to your next projects and in celebration of this milestone, this 50th anniversary of Caravanserai. Thank, thank you, you so both much. for your hearts. And let's do it again differently. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. Thanks again. Take, Take care. care. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.